uh, uh, Andrei Vladirimescu is an IEEE Life Fellow since 2017 and IEEE Class Society Vice President of confer Conferences. Um, he received his Master and PhD degrees in EECS from the University of California, Berkeley, where he was a key contributor to Spy Simulator and author of the Spice Book. For many years, Andrei was R&D director, leading the design and implementation of innovative electronic design automation products and in software uh, research project of California and of Berkeley and the Technical University of Delft as, as well as a consultant to industry on new devices and circuits for quantum computing. So I'm going to leave the stairs is yours. Thank you very much for very, this very nice introduction and uh, thank you uh, the organizers for inviting me. Uh, to talk a little bit uh, about uh, an exciting project. Uh, and also I'd like to uh, mention that the organizers of this conference are one of the most professional teams that uh, I've known for the last few years in organizing here in Bordeaux conferences. So I want to start with ICCS 2018, those of you who were here, the same uh, uh, the same team of Nathalie Deltemp, uh, uh, Francois Rive, uh, followed by uh, the analog VLSI workshop uh, exactly a year ago, and now uh, the premier CAS conference, uh, ICI, uh, <laughs> easy, easy CAS. It's the easy CAS. Yes, so uh, I hope to uh, an even bigger conference, maybe the biggest CAS uh, pretty soon. Okay. So today I would like to present uh, some of the achievements uh, of uh, the QTech group uh, in building a quantum computer at the Technical University of uh, Delft. Oh, I cannot use this. Okay. So, uh, acknowledgements. Uh, this work uh, was done uh, in collaboration uh, with Intel Corporation, uh, supported by a grant from Intel. And uh, I, pre I would very much want to mention my colleagues, uh, Eduardo Charbon, Fabio Sebastiano, Lieben van der Seypen, who uh, in, in whose group were built uh, structures that I'm going to show you, Masud Babaye, and uh, our fantastic PhD students, Jeroen van Dijk, Vishnu Patra, Pascal Hart, Menno Veldkors, Gordano Scapucci, Chao Xu, uh, Stefan Phillips and so on, as well as Stefano Pellerano and some of his uh, colleagues at Inter. So uh, in my talk today, of course, I will give you first an overview, the state of the industry, because we can now talk about quantum computing as an industry. Um, and uh, some then I will follow with some of the basics uh, of quantum computing, the quantum bit, the, what are quantum circuits. Uh, again, they're not the same circuits as uh, you guys have been talking all these days. Uh, the quantum computer architecture and control uh, introduced the concept of cryosimons and uh, what is needed to build a quantum controller. And uh, then uh, talk a, a little bit about the future of, um, of uh, quantum computer in CMOS. Well, it all started with uh, a famous physicist, Nobel Prize winner, um, Richard Feynman, uh, who had an, uh, such an uh, outrageous idea that uh, he and um, a ghostwriter published a book. No, you don't go. A book called Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. Well, maybe he was joking. I don't know if he really believed that this will happen. But now it's actually going to happen, uh, and it's in the implementation stages, uh, his proposal to use entanglement and superposition for uh, actual computation. And, uh, you know, the idea came and went since the 1980s, but what happens today is that technological background is there, that we actually can say that, yes, it's feasible to, to use uh, superposition uh, and entanglement uh, by quantum uh, particles uh, to, uh, to, you, to build into a real computer, a quantum computer. 
Uh, this thing is interesting. He gave a speech in 1959 and there were published a paper that there is uh, plenty of room at the bottom. What he meant is that at the bottom of the material, at the atomic structure, there is a lot of room to use uh, phenomena in order to build useful computing and, uh, and other, um, other activities. Now, so today the major two implementation trends for uh, quantum computers are or transmonds and, and electron spin uh, in uh, semiconductors. Uh, the reason that we feel that this is the winner going forward is the advancement of semiconductor technology. I mean, we, we keep every year going to finer and finer dimensions. We're now at seven nanometers. We're going to go to five nanometers and so on. So we're going to the atomic scale that Feynman was imagining in his uh, historical talk that you know we can build cubes of uh, five atoms by five atoms and by five atoms that can actually perform uh, a certain uh, function and, and be useful. And the other major factor here is that silicon technology is scalable because as you'll see, the uh, elements of information and computation in a quantum system uh, are uh, the actual quantum states uh, of particles. And uh, in order to use this, we need hundreds of thousands or even a million. And obviously using a technology that uh, is scalable like semiconductor technology is uh, the winning proposition. Now, what are uh, we uh, today in terms of uh, markets, startups, and so on. So three billion were invested in the last year only. This is out of five billion invested over the last 20 years. So it is actually an exponential ramp up. However, it's only, uh, according to this study by uh, Capgemini, it's only 3% of uh, the companies that actually are really considering and looking how they could fit quantum computing in, uh, uh, in their organization. Um, now, the, uh, today it's like a half, half a billion market, uh, but uh, the growth rate is expect, expected to be around 25%. Some of the names of the more established companies are IBM, Riketi, Continuum, uh, and then there are a lot of uh, startups, like the most funny one is this uh, Polaris Quantum Biotech, which they combine quantum computing with AI and uh, biotech. So uh, very interesting that, they, you know, if they succeed, we'll live forever. But I won't be around to, to find this out. I hope that you, some of you will. Um, anyway, so how do we measure the performance? How do we say that this quantum computer is better than the other one or is more powerful? Now, the standard thing has been and still is uh, to measure the number of qubits. And where are we today? So uh, last year, uh, IBM announced that uh, their largest uh, quantum processor has 127 qubits and uh, they plan uh, in two or three years to have uh, 1,000 or over uh, qubits. Now, IonQ, uh, a, new, uh, a newer company, which also has a full uh, processor called Air Aria, they uh, figured out that, uh, you know, they call the measure the performance algorithmic qubits. That means how many qubits can they use for uh, implementing, for running a specific algorithm. And then IBM also came with another definition. I just saw a talk uh, a week or so ago where they combine performance as number of qubits, quantum volume, that means how many circuits, quantum circuits they can build with the qubits they have, and uh, then the uh, speed as uh, quantum circuits per second. Now, this is the generic view uh, of uh, uh, what we call a full stack quantum computer, which you can see starts with the quantum algorithm, uh, compilers, uh, arithmetic, uh, and so on, getting down to an instruction set, so the architecture um, 
of, uh, of the computer. Uh, and then this is the quantum execution and control unit. And then it's the quantum to classical interface and the quantum chip. So in this talk, and the work that we're doing is going to refer to the uh, bottom uh, three categories. Okay, basics. So the key element, the fundament, let's say, of uh, building a quantum computer is the quantum bit. The quantum bit is an interesting concept because it corresponds to the logic bit that we know today. But the logic bit can be either zero or one. The quantum bit is a combination, a superposition of the states zero and one, where at any time the quantum bit can be uh, with a probability of alpha zero in state zero and with a probability alpha one in state one. What is another interesting concept here is that a qubit is at the same time the unit of information but also the elementary gate. So um, if you look, uh, if you read some of the literature in uh, quantum, you see quantum circuits, quantum circuits. Quantum circuits are nothing else than quantum bits because you know you operate on the uh, quantum bit and so the quantum bit is the elementary gate. The way we represent the state of uh, a quantum bit is what is called the block sphere and uh, it's, uh, a unity vector here that can be in any way in any place in this uh, on this surface between the limit states of zero uh, and one the implementation is either as the spin of a particle like electron spin nuclear spin and uh, or there's a uh, semiconductor uh, qubits or uh, transports these are the classic um, implementations today so these are any processor that you see today is going to be one of this. And here you have a few pictures. This was the state of the art in 2019. This is the famous uh, Google chip uh, that uh, the paper called uh, Quantum Supremacy, uh, showing uh, all, uh, you know, claiming all the fantastic things that a quantum <laughs> computer can do. Um, a smaller version, a smaller version of the IBM. IBM chip, the Intel chip with 49 qubits. But as I told you today, so this was the state uh, two years ago or so. So today were uh, maximum 127 qubits available. But okay, so we have hardware. We can build quantum bits, but are we there in terms of having an actual working quantum processor? And uh, the question, the thing is, yeah, we can do some experiments, but for solving real problems like building mole molecules, analyzing uh, different materials, and so we need many more uh, qubits. And uh, when we talk about the number of qubits, uh, we can differentiate between physical qubits that are implemented, uh, let's say, in a semiconductor, uh, and uh, the actual logic qubits that we're using for computation. Why is that? The fact is that um, the state of, uh, of a quantum bit is, uh, is very, um, uh, how shall I, it's very illusionary in the sense that you can sense it for a very, very short uh, amount of time. So you need a lot of error correction and um, redundancy uh, in this computation. That's why usually uh, we need like 10 times more uh, physical qubits than uh, we can use as uh, computation or logic qubits. Um, also, what we need, uh, and this is what uh, the big achievements of the last uh, three, four years is longer coherence time. Co the coherence time is the time that um, the particle, the, the spin is kept uh, and uh, usually this is at a very low temperature, around uh, 20 millik, 22 uh, millikelvin, 20 to 100 millikelvin. So if we can lengthen the coherence time and raise the actual temperature uh, where this uh, uh, the state, the quantum state, can be preserved, then we can really improve uh, the capacity. Uh, and the computation of, uh, of a quantum processor. Now, 
people ask, well, so which implementation is the better one? Well, uh, our group has, uh, I mean, at the TU Delft, we had both uh, with teams working both on uh, spin uh, qubits and, uh, and Josephson junctions. And it is our belief that uh, uh, it is the spin qubit uh, in semiconductors that is going to win the race and it's going to be the future. And the key here is scalability. Okay? Um, and the, how are we going to control this state? What is a qubit? A qubit is actually going to be a trapped electron uh, in a potential uh, well. Uh, so this represents the quantum dot or a single electron transistor, as you can see in, uh, in many publications. Here is uh, a picture, an electron microscope uh, picture of uh, one of these Q dots implemented at, uh, at QTEC. Uh, you see that there is a micromagnet <coughs> surrounding uh, the structure. And if you look at the structure, there is nothing that but uh, something that looks very much like a MOS transistor, where uh, you have uh, the quantum well here. Uh, these are the left uh, plunger and the right plunger, the blue and the red. And after each one, we have uh, trapped uh, uh, an electron. Uh, these electrons uh, are coming from uh, a supply, uh, like a source, the equivalent of a source, which we'll see in the next picture. Um, now, the gate above the uh, microwave, uh, con no, the, the gate LP and RP enable the tunneling of an electron into, into the well. The, the other terminal, the MW, uh, performs uh, uh, actions between the two, enabling uh, opening the um, uh, the energy well for entangling uh, the two qubits. So this is a, a schematic picture of a two qubit um, quantum processor, if you want. Um, now, the very interesting achievement here is that such a quantum dot quantum bit can be implemented in the standard uh, uh, process. Uh, it is, I'll show you a picture of an Intel process uh, on, on a standard uh, 300 millimeter wafer. And um, the spin then can be controlled by, um, by the two gates, the microwave signal that is, uh, that is applied to the field, to the magnetic field, and um, then uh, the barrier is also controlled. It's not shown here, but by this terminal T. So these are the two uh, actions uh, on uh, uh, the operators, let's say, the potential that apply the operators to, to the two bits. Uh, this is another picture of, uh, you know, it shows here the electron reservoir <laughs> where the um, electrons are moved into uh, into the well, into the two uh, uh, quantum dots, and then uh, the exchange where uh, you, we can lower the, the barrier in order to have entanglement, entanglement between the two. Here is the picture of, um, I think it's, uh, it's what, it's like uh, two, four, eight, um, eight quantum dots uh, built into, uh, a 300 uh, um, millimeter processing line. And here is the top picture uh, of a standard uh, Intel process. <laughs> and this is an uh, early picture where you compare like uh, uh, industrial fabrication line with uh, what was uh, built in the lab, but that's the past because this is the latest uh, implementation of a quantum bit array, six, uh, six quantum bits. Uh, on a 90 nanometer pitch uh, at QTEC. Okay, so this is the basic element of a quantum process. Now, how people speak of quantum computers, and you can read already papers that are you going to have a quantum computer in your next uh, phone? Well, obviously not. 
I mean, the quantum computer is not going to exist as an independent classical computer like we have today. The quantum uh, computer is going to be like an attached processor, like the processor that is being controlled by what we call here a classic controller. So the classic electronic controller will generate all the signals in order to perform operations on the qubit that, uh, you know, in the most simplified way is the, um, uh, is the chip that I showed you before, like six, uh, uh, six pin qubit. This product, as I mentioned, in order to be able to sense and uh, read uh, the state of the operation uh, uh, is, uh, has to be held in a dilution refrigerator at 20 to 100 uh, millikelvin. So a signal generated and then the controller needs to sense and interpret the results of the computation. The way it is done to, today, you can see here, where all that instrumentation is outside the dilution refrigerator. Here is the dilution refrigerator, and at the bottom uh, is uh, the quantum uh, chip. Uh, and all these standard instruments have cables that are plunged uh, into, um, into the dilution refrigerator. And you can realize that, yeah, if you have uh, uh, tens of them, maybe 100, uh, you can you can do it. But look, you're eventually going to fill all this volume. So this is obviously not a scalable solution. So um, it's bulky, limited wiring, fridge, cooling power, and all these uh, problems. So what is there a better solution? Yeah, the better solution is called cryogenic CMOS. And this is the idea to move the electronics in uh, as an integrated circuit uh, next, next to uh, the quantum processor, to the quantum chip. So um, my colleague and friend from uh, TU Delta, Eduardo, uh, you know, got a bunch of us together because he was decided uh, to, that we need to move, which we all agreed on, uh, to move the control electronics as a CMOS IC next, uh, next to the qubits. Now, um, we needed to prove that actually works. I mean, yeah, it's a nice idea, but will a transistor behave at uh, 4 degree Kelvin or 1 degree Kelvin the same as it does at 300K? So that was not, uh, not clear uh, at that time. And as you can see here, skeptics galore. I mean, uh, some of the physicists were working with this. That's why do you need this? I mean, look, it works very well with the standard instrumentation that we have today. Uh, it, it was going so far that when we first wanted to publish a paper about, uh, uh, you know, uh, CMOS uh, control chip uh, at IEDM in 2016, the paper was rejected. But look today, today you have cryo session, uh, cryo CMOS session at uh, many of, uh, uh, of, the, um, <laughs> of the conferences. So uh, the major conferences, you'll always see a session on uh, uh, cryogenic CMOS. So the idea is that we have, as I mentioned uh, here, uh, uh, here are our quantum bits, uh, uh, quantum processor, and we bring the control chip uh, operating at four degree Kelvin uh, next uh, to uh, the electronics and uh, next to, uh, to the qubits and everything else. So the, you know, we have uh, very few lines then going to the outside world for, uh, uh, you know, passing on the instructions, the compiled, the compiled program by a classical computer are transformed into instruction for the quantum uh, CMOS uh, pro, uh, controller and then executed on the quantum processor and the results are sent back. So uh, having all this high number of channels, the only solution that uh, is viable is uh, VLSI uh, CMOS. But, okay, so these were ideas, what we wanted to do, but now, we had to figure out, do uh, semiconductor transistors work at four degree Kelvin or one degree Kelvin? 
And the first, uh, the first attempt was not very encouraging. We looked at bipolar, we had some bipolar test chips. And uh, as you can see here uh, in um, the IC versus VBE or the beta versus uh, uh, meter pattern, things break down after below like um, uh, towards probably up to 200K or so. So the last uh, working line is probably this one around uh, 133 or 100. So around the hundred, below 100K, uh, bipolar transistors didn't work. But today there are uh, heterostructured uh, bipolar transistors that actually uh, were proven to work. But we went to CMOS. I mean, the MOS device is a much simpler device uh, based on um, drift rather than diffusion. And uh, we, um, we tested two technologies. We built uh, test chips in 160 uh, nanometers and 40 nanometers. And of course, you know, we saw some surprises. There were uh, phenomena that uh, showed up that were different. But overall, the transistors behaved the, uh, the same way in terms of uh, IV, uh, ID, VD, ID, VG. Uh, characteristics as uh, as you can see here. Now this is the 160 or 0 0.16 micron chip. You see uh, what is interesting that uh, up to you know having a thin oxide typical uh, transistor, the uh, characteristics look fine. Look fine. You go to a thick oxide where you you have um, you can raise the voltage up to 3.3 .3 volts. You recognize some of you who have been around for a while and uh, knew um, the partially depleted SOI transistor, the famous thin defect, which uh, analog designers hate, obviously, but uh, you know, digital guys can live with it. But obviously, all this control electronics that we're talking about here is analog. So we needed to have uh, a transistor working cleanly like uh, these characteristics. Um, in general, what we noticed, uh, you get a higher current because mobility is uh, typically twice as high. The threshold increases a little bit, but this doesn't affect it. And as expected, uh, the sub-threshold uh, slope improves. Okay, you say, but why does it improve only uh, by four times when the uh, ratio of temperature, I mean, the improvement, if, if uh, physics was as simple as the definition of the subthreshold slope. I should improve by um, the ratio of temperatures. Well, uh, the problem is that uh, there are other effects coming in that I will mention in a minute. Just wanted to show you that in 40 nanometer CMOS, this kink effect uh, does not show up. So this was the first uh, technology of choice for us to build uh, a demonstrator of uh, all the control electronics. Uh, here, you know, we had all these structures, so uh, we showed uh, that they work at 4K. We showed uh, proved also good operation at the 1 Kelvin and uh, all the way down to 100 millikelvin. The transistors worked, and this, the two slides on the right, the two pictures on the right are only uh, measurements, but the one on the left on the left actually uh, shows uh, both, um, this uh, shows both the 300K, uh, the dotted lines and the 4K. So you can see uh, the difference. Also the velocity saturation is less. And what, happen, what happens here is that uh, uh, going down to 4K, you have uh, um, an, uh, change in interface states and the ionization state of the impurities, which actually leads to, uh, to this non-ideality factor N that uh, you know shows up in the exponential of the current in subthreshold, that th this factor N uh, increases with temperature. So that's why you actually won't see that the subthreshold slope is reducing uh, as much as the ratio of temperatures between 300K and 4K. Uh, modeling was done and uh, we managed to uh, match everything very well. Now, designing the uh, control electronics now uh, that uh, we got over the problem that uh, CMOS works, 
is um, you know very restrictive uh, conditions. So we have a very limited uh, noise budget. The total power consumption of the controller chip cannot be more than one watt, which you know planning for thousands of qubits or so uh, limits us to like uh, much less than uh, two milliwatts per qubit. The physical dimensions, and here, you know, it's again the vision of uh, Feynman that we need to build something with atomic dimensions, uh, you know, to actually uh, have some useful, uh, useful application. The chip needs really to be, uh, uh, I mean, each qubit, 30 nanometers, such, you know, multiply this by a thousand, uh, 10,000 so that we can fit it inside the, the dilution refrigerator. And uh, the, we have a bandwidth between like one and maybe 20 gigahertz that needs to be multiplied. So here is a uh, um, measure that um, a controller uh, is measured by, which is uh, fidelity, the fidelity of an operation. So ideally the qubit or the state should be controlled with 100% accuracy um, uh, from um, the signals uh, generated by the control electron. But in, re in reality, there are uh, many non-idealities, both at the circuit level and uh, at, um, at the electron spin level, such that, um, you know, we generate uh, we generate a signal from the uh, controller, uh, we get the results back, and then we can measure the fidelity. And usually we want to have a fidelity up to this level. Although 99.9% .9 is what is accepted today as a workable uh, fidelity. And here, in order to obtain this, you see that for the signals, the microwave signals generated, we have very strict limitation on frequency, amplitude, duration, and so on. Now, um, there are many aspects of, uh, of the design that uh, need to be satisfied uh, in order to, uh, to meet all these requirements. And one of them uh, that is really hurting is that sub-threshold is not an option. Because you think, okay, you need to control your power. So what we're going to do, we're going to run at very low current. But look what happens in sub-threshold. You know, you can imagine that with far fewer ionized uh, impurities, you, the uh, conduction of current becomes almost uh, discrete. That you have discrete uh, electrons and holes moving around. So you can see in this substantial characteristic the uh, typical discontinuities that uh, well, uh, the typical reason for it is what's uh, being called the Coulomb blockade is the uh, discrete way that, um, that the state of a particle goes from one energy level to the next uh, possible uh, energy level. Anyway, that sub-threshold therefore is not an option. Then we need to, uh, to uh, worry about variability in the threshold, in the um, gain factor beta, and in the sub-threshold slope. So they all will uh, introduce non-idealities, which eventually will hit the fidelity. And here, if we did, uh, you know, we did a number of measurements, uh, we get with a standard um, uh, distribution. And what we observe is that when we go from uh, 300K in brown uh, towards 4K, you see how the uh, mismatch between two identical components explodes. And this is the minimum, uh, minimum size device. You increase the size of the device and, you know, you control the mismatch and the variability better, which is in line with Pelgrom's rule. Uh, it's proven here. You can see uh, uh, how uh, we model this, that uh, we uh, managed a very good fit between measurements and uh, simulated um, mismatch. And also what you measure, uh, mentioned, uh, notice here that there is a huge jump between 300K and uh, 200K, but then between 200K and going very low, 
there is a little change. Okay. Now uh, here is proof of um, of the good match of the models with uh, the measured uh, uh, variability um, and mismatch. And uh, here is a, a very interesting issue. If we compare the increase of mismatch uh, at uh, a transistor at the same gate voltage. We can see that uh, between um, high, uh, v, um, high VG and going towards uh, uh, the threshold voltage, there is a ninefold increase uh, in mismatch from 400 to 300K. 300K in brown, 4K in, in blue. However, if we operate the device at constant GM over ID, we will see. Uh, we'll see that uh, the increase is very small uh, in mismatch. So this is one way that uh, one can design circuits. Now, obviously heating and self-heating of the transistor is a critical issue because we don't want to uh, have too much uh, uh, temperature increase inside uh, the dilution refrigerator. So here we built another quantum um, um, test chip that uh, eventually uh, showed us uh, we had a central heater, this one, and we had um, uh, diodes that uh, were measuring a sensor. And what we observed is that, come on, here. You see, uh, if we have only a, a low power on the heater, we still have only um, a jump in temperature at very low power. But this jump in temperature, so the um, actual temperature of the device compared to uh, the ambient is uh, going up to uh, 50, uh, 50 degree Kelvin, but then it just levels off, which is also shown by this characteristic. So in other words, we can, from a practical point of view, assume that uh, our transistor operates at 50 degree Kelvin. We'll model it at 50 degree Kelvin, and we don't need to be too sensitive because here you see the sensitivity. You know, the sensitivity then uh, above 50K is pretty constant and doesn't vary much. And we also model this behavior very well. Now, uh, here are the uh, design. Uh, design uh, conclusions that uh, that we uh, drew from uh, these first uh, chips. First of all, that compact models are essential because you cannot you cannot design a quantum chip or a quantum control chip with the PDKs that the founder is uh, providing. Um, also, and we did you know part of this work was developing. Uh, the appropriate models of all, in all the categories that I mentioned. Uh, Sub-threshold is not an option. Variability and mismatch must be uh, controlled with different techniques. Uh, and uh, self-heating, uh, it's uh, an interesting issue, but it's not as um, big an issue as uh, we thought before. We're doing all these experiments because, uh, as I mentioned, the device temperature jumps to like 40, 50 K and then pretty much uh, stays there. Okay. So now how about circuits? We build circuits, but before we go uh, from device to circuit, we need to co-design the control electronics with actually the quantum behavior uh, of, um, of the qubit. And for this, we built a um, emulator, a simulator emulator that would solve at the same time in synchro, uh, synchronously the circuit by SPICE and using a quantum solver for uh, giving us a, at every step during uh, application of the signals the value of the quantum state. The quantum state is represented by psi and uh, we needed to solve the uh, Schrodinger's equation. And actually, as you can see here, is just an ordinary differential equation of time. And um, 
in the uh, element uh, here, the operator H is the Hamiltonian that describes the system. That means the signals are represented by the frequency of the microwave signal that is applied uh, to, um, uh, to the qubit. Now, how did we do that? Well, it's very easy. If you think how SPICE works, SPICE works uh, on uh, quantum um, quantizing the time. A time interval. So it's a quasi static uh, time domain solution. And the same thing can be applied to Schrodinger's equation. And you can see here how we proceed step by step in solving this. Okay, so this is an example I'm not going to go into where there are three different parts. There is, um, you know, a part modeled in very log A, which uh, uh, controls the length of the envelope. So these are envelopes uh, that are then multiplied with the microwave signal and the length of um, uh, of the envelope decides the angle of rotation of um, the uh, quantum state in uh, uh, on block sphere and uh, then the effect of these signals can be solved by the quantum solver, which shows us the variation of uh, the quantum thing. So we're not going to go to this example, and we're just going to conclude with the two uh, generation of control chips that we built, one in 40 nanometer, and the most recent one called Horse Ridge, uh, designed by our students and uh, implemented by Intel. Of course, Intel had also part of the design, and uh, here, I'm not going to go into detail, but we built every little component uh, of, uh, the con of the control. Um, those are the, some of the characteristics. This is the latest um, a force reach chip built in 22 nanometer FinFET uh, uh, by Intel. Uh, the general uh, block diagram. And here you can see that uh, this, um, this chip can control up to 128 bits and it can generate different envelopes for uh, controlling the state of the qubit. Here is the chip and uh, the board that was built in order to introduce the chip and control, um, in, uh, control the qubits in, uh, um, in the dilution refrigerator. In conclusion, Scalability is the main factor, and uh, with semiconductor te technology that we have today, uh, we can easily build tens or hundreds of thousands of uh, qubits if needed. Um, the electron speed qubits, I think, offer the best solutions to achieve um, the control and the fidelity uh, that we need in order to be able to uh, uh, read out uh, the results um, safely uh, and reliably. And the goal, the ultimate goal, is to have a fully integrated chip uh, or cube, a semiconductor cube, in which we'll have at the same time at different levels the qubits and the control electronics. So this is like a visionary uh, picture of um, the classical electronics here with the qubits, and this would be a 3D view. Uh, so today we're here. This is our horse ridge chip, and here are the qubits that I showed you, the quantum dots, and this will be the next thing. Thank you very much, and sorry that, uh, you know, we have uh, not uh, going to have a break before the uh, final words of the our a very appreciated organizer. Thank you. So we thank you, Marie, for this uh, very interesting talk. So we have now uh, time for only one question. So we think uh, really about it. And um, we invite you to uh, ask your question during the gala dinner, since we have the chance to keep our guest uh, um, during, until tonight. So. Yes. Yeah. Maybe uh, one question. Just a short one. 
Uh, so because we just present uh, there are many research on the electron spin qubits. Have you, uh, like in QTA, have you tried to develop the system which is based on the whole spin qubit? Um, I, I'm not sure I understood your question. Because the, the qubit, the semiconductor qubits that you presented are mainly the electron spin qubits. Yeah. And have you tried the whole spin qubits? 